Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. And Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. Our guest today is Derek Isaacs. Derek has written four books. One of them is his first book, The Extinction of Evolution. And we're going to talk about that subject today. It's a fascinating title. Would you explain it to us? Well, The Extinction of Evolution, the title came because I wrote the book really for theistic evolutionists. The guys that want to believe in evolution and want to believe in God. By the time they see what Darwin, who he was, what he taught, actually what he said, the theory would be extinct in their mind. You, you know, uh, Derek, when I read the, the hardcore evolutionists, they don't see any compatibility between a theory of creation and a, a theory of evolution. Uh, it, it, and it's these people in the mushy middle, that theistic evolutionists, who want to get along with everybody, uh, and, and it seems to me they have a hard time nailing down truth. Right. They, they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be exactly. accepted by the world, but they also want to be saved. And I'm sorry, but uh, the gospel is enmity to the world. So you're going to give us some clear choices today. I am. Good. I'm excited to hear what you have for us. In the book Extinction of Evolution, I read Charles Darwin's primary books, The Voyage of the Beagle, The Descent of Man, and On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, what I would like to do for your viewers is to show them Charles Darwin's words himself about his own theory. I think that's uh, something that people need to hear. First of all, we need to understand what Darwin thought of mankind. And so these are Charles Darwin's words himself. This is what he said. He says, I believe in this extreme part of South America that man exists in a lower state of improvement than in any other part of the world. You see, uh, Charles Darwin, in his base belief, he believed that man was evolving and some people were more evolved than others. And when he got down to South America, he says these people are the least evolved than anyone anywhere anyone in the world. So you can see right out of the gate that racism is built into his theory of evolution. He went on to say, while going one day on shore near Wollaston Island, we pulled alongside a canoe. These were the most abject and miserable creatures I anywhere beheld. This is fascinating because he is now equating these people not as humans, but creatures and miserable creatures at that. Their skill in some respects, he continued, may be compared to the instinct of animals, for it is not improved by experience. The canoe, their most ingenious work, poor as it is, has remained the same for the last 250 years. And what he's doing is he's connecting the, inst the instinct of like a beaver to these people, because we know that beavers have an instinct to build a dam. And no beaver is going to come around saying, I got this brand new architectural design that's going to increase water flow efficiency into my dam. They're just going to always do what they do, which is to build a dam. I don't want to slow you down, but I just want our people to think. Can you imagine the arrogance of just pulling your boat alongside these guys in a canoe and judging all of that from just looking down and seeing them? Oh, it's arrogance unbridled. Yes, it is. In every which way. And he went on. Yes. He said, one of our arms being bared, they expressed the liveliest surprise and admiration at its whiteness just in the same way in which I've seen the orangutan do at the zoological gardens. I now, did. first of all, he's like, they're admiring my white skin. That is what he's saying. But the danger here is he has now connected them to orangutans at the zoological garden. He's making a comparison and goes, they are like these. Now, I don't know how he knows the orangutan is admiring his white skin either, but that is apparently the jump that he's willing to take. He goes on to say, it might also naturally be inquired whether man, like so many other animals, has given rise to varieties and subraces differing but slightly from each other or to races differing so much that they must be classed as a doubtful species. He asks this loaded question, is it possible that there are different species within mankind? And then he goes on and answers it. He goes, do the races or species of men, whichever term may be applied, encroach on and replace each other so that they finally become extinct? We shall see that all of these questions must be answered in the affirmative. So his answer is yes, there are some humans that are more evolved than others. And then he goes on and says, let the strongest live and the weakest die. And that is how, in his mind, survival of the fittest weeds out those who are stronger and those who are weaker. And then he talks about women. The chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than woman can attain, whether requiring deep thought or reason. So he makes a clear distinction between the evolution of men and the evolution of women. He goes on and says, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands. He goes, the average standard of mental power in man must be above that of a woman. 
<laughs> and just in case he wasn't clear, man is more courageous, pugnacious, and energetic than woman, has more inventive genius. And one more time, thus man has ultimately become superior to woman. And I am floored when I see a woman driving down the highway with a Darwin fish on her bumper. I'm like, do you have any idea the guy that's on your bumper? And I am floored when I look at like ninth grade textbooks from school and see how we glorify this man uh, who is a terrible racist and a terrible chauvinist, and yet we, we make him out to our children to be one of the great heroes of science. It is the lie of revisionist history. Yes, You're absolutely right. A yes. great time to look at Galatians 3.28, which says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. It's just a Amen. healing balm Amen. of the scriptures right there. That's right. Now, he goes on and says, Many persons are convinced, as it appears to me with justice, that members of our aristocracy, including under this term all wealthy families, from having chosen during many generations from all classes the more beautiful women as their wives, have become handsomer according to the European standard of beauty than the middle class. He is now saying that people with money, because they are choosing the sure. better looking wives, are evolving to become more, to be better looking. The guy in my mind is psychotic. So the, the nobility in England is superior to the common folk. That's exactly what yes. he's saying. But modern science yes. disagrees with him. He Absolutely. goes, by DNA analysis, Francis Collins said, we humans are truly part of one family. This remarkably low genetic diversity distinguishes us from most other species on the planet. Darwin was wrong. Yes. Now, what did the early adopters of evolution do? Am I just cherry picking quotes from Darwin or did they agree with Darwin? Ernest Haeckel said this, at the lowest stage of human mental development are the Australians, some tribes of the Polynesians and the Bushmen, Hottentots, and some of the Negro tribes. So they, had, they adopted it in the early 1900s, this concept that people with fairer skin were more evolved than people, people with darker skin. And he said, Ernest Haeckel went on and says, nothing, however, is perhaps more remarkable in this respect than that some of the wildest tribes in southern Asia and eastern Africa have no trace whatever of the first foundations of all humanity, of human civilization, of family, life, and marriage. They lived together in herds like apes. So this was a sound that absolutely resonated throughout the early 1900s, and people are now in their mind thinking that some people are more evolved than others. And it led to horrible things. Australian Aborigines were actually killed and taken to London as museum specimens of the missing link between ape men and modern humans. A pygmy by the name of Otabinga, which is shown here, was placed on exhibit in the Monkey House Zoo at the Bronx in 1906. This is our own American history putting people in zoos because of the theory of evolution. That's right. And then came eugenics, which was led by Francis Galton and Major Darwin. Francis Galton was the cousin of Charles Darwin. Major Darwin was the son of Darwin. And he, these are the leading forces of this thing called eugenics in the early 1900s. And look at this article that I found in the New York Times, September 25th. Um, it doesn't have the year up there, but back in the early 1900s, it says, Want more babies and best families? This is a eugenics headline. Major Darwin, that's Darwin's son, sees a patriotic duty of better classes to increase their offspring. It says limitation also needed. Danger of best types disappearing and the inferior multiplying, he tells eugenists. So I want the believers out there to understand, here's this idea that came from evolution, that limitation is needed among some people of humanity. What did that lead to? It led to the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, who was an evolutionist and she was a eugenicist. And she, par Planned Parenthood is the largest provider of abortions, I think, in the world. Yes. She published The Purpose of Eugenics and Birth Control and Positive Eugenics. So abortion is the symptom of the original disease. And that's the point we need to understand here. Eugenics breeders believed American society was not ready to implement an organized lethal solution. But many mental institutions and doctors practice improvised medical lethality and passive euthanasia on their own. So abortion wasn't just it. You know, they, they wanted to kill babies in the womb, but they also wanted to have the right to kill other babies once they were born. Sure. And this is all from the theory of evolution in Charles Darwin. That's absolutely right. One institution in Lincoln, Illinois, fed its incoming patients milk from a tubercular cows, believing a eugenically strong individual would be immune. 30 to 40 percent annual death rates resulted at Lincoln. They were killing babies in droves because of the theory of evolution. 
and, and then go across the pond into Germany. In 1934, as Germany's sterilizations were accelerating beyond 5,000 per month, the California eugenics leader bragged to a colleague, you'll be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in shaping the opinions of the group of intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this epic-making program. We can tie Hitler directly to Darwin. Hitler even wrote a fan letter to American eugenicist leader Madison Grant calling his race based eugenics book, The Passing of the Great Race, his own Bible. And I go through a lot of these quotes in the book so that for documentation of all of this, but he looked upon anyone who was weaker and he thought the strong had every right to press upon and exterminate the weak. And that is exactly what he did. Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of the evolutionary theory. And so this wasn't just something that I cherry-picked. This isn't something oh, no. that I just found. Even Stephen Jay Gould, who was a renowned atheist and evolutionist, realized that with the theory of evolution that there was all kinds of bigotry and racism that came out from that. You know, Derek, I'm so grateful that you're pointing out the dark side of Darwinism, that evolution has a horrible racist past. And uh, our people need to know that before they just swallow the whole hog. We have to take a break. But when we come back, we want to talk about where's evolution today? Is this racist past still a part of uh, the evolution that's being taught today? We're going to talk about that. So you stay with us. We'll be right back. Today's guest on Origins, Derek Isaacs, is an author, speaker, and television producer. Derek is president and founder of Watchman 33, an organization that's focused on defending and confirming the authority of the Bible. He's also written several books, including The Extinction of Evolution and Dragons or Dinosaurs. Book orders are being taken at 1-800-631-5802. For more information, Write to Bridge Logos Foundation, 17750 Northwest 115th Avenue, Building 200, Suite 220, Alachua, Florida 32615. Or visit the website at www.bridgelogos.com. We are back with Derek Isaacs, and we're talking about the extinction of evolution, or perhaps why we wish evolution was extinct. We're looking at some of the horrible dark past of evolution that somehow doesn't show up when we're teaching our kids that they ought to make Darwin one of their rock stars. Uh, but uh, where are we today? We've looked at the past and there is this horrible racism and so forth and, and really there's blood on the hands of, of the evolutionists as they've propagated the theory that made some people better than others to kill others. Uh, but where are we today? Has that been uh, removed or is that still part of the program? Now where, and as a biblical apologist, we, we had to understand where it came from and the foundations of it. Okay. And so now, how do we deal with it? And to okay. understand how we deal with it, we got to know where are the people that believe in it now? Where do they want to take it? You know, right now, we know that evolution is taught as our origin in our public schools. It's illegal to talk about the Bible. Teachers are being fired for handing out a Bible. Um, you know, there is just, teachers are just not free to speak about their opinions anymore. You're not even allowed in Pennsylvania to teach that the same evidence could point towards a designer, much less a God. Uh, that we can't even say this seems to have an ordered system so there might have been an intelligent designer. That's illegal to teach in Pennsylvania. That's amazing to me. It, you know, and it's because of, if you boil it down, it's because the evolutionists fear, they fear the truth of God. They can't win an argument. They do. They cannot win an argument, and they fear being accountable to a god. And so they, they don't even want the discussion to take place because the, they understand that if, if the discussion is won by our side, that they are accountable to an all-powerful creator god. And they want, to, they want to continue to live in their sin and not be accountable. I, I believe you're absolutely right. So what we have to talk about is what is the result um, on society for evolution? Well... E.O. Wilson, a professor at Harvard, had this to say, Humanity was thus born of earth, however elevated in power over the rest of life, however exalted in self-image, we are descended from the animals by the same blind force that created those animals. And what an astonishing quote, because what does he say right out of the gate? Humanity was thus born of earth. So immediately, 
he's taken away the supernatural. Sure. You know, and he's pointing to a Mother Earth, Earth, if you will, because, well, we're not accountable to a Mother Earth. And so he wants to set that out there. Then he says, however elevated in power over the rest of life, however exalted in self-image. What he's done, he's taken an arrow and shot across the bow of our biblical belief. He knows that we were created in the image of God. Yeah. And so he's saying here, he you may think it. you have an exalted self-image, but you don't. And that we are just animals by a blind force. Now what's interesting is he calls himself a scientist, but where is this blind force? Where did it come from and how does he know about it? Those would all be questions I'd ask him. Yeah. Now, and then William Provine, a professor of biological sciences at Cornell University, he adds to basically what E.O. Wilson was saying, and this is what he says about what evolutionary biology means to him. He said, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. He said, that's the end for me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. At least he's an honest evolutionist. Which there are far and few between. And he is saying that if you really believe this, the implications are life has no meaning, it has no purpose, and there's no life after death. Right, and so you wonder why our children have self-esteem issues. And the guy before him, Wilson, told us that they're just animals. That's right. We're just walking sacks of bone and water to somehow gain consciousness. And, and we're, not really con uh, we're not really responsible for our actions because we're just animals. We're That's just, right. Yeah. That's what they're we're teaching. We're just working on impulse. You know? And so not, you know, our, our wives, yeah. our children, our brothers, yeah. our sisters are just meaningly, they're meaningless in this worldview of evolution. And think about that's what Satan wants us to believe. Yeah. We were created in the image of God, created to have a divine, a relationship with the creator of the universe. And what Satan has, has done is made so many people think that they are absolutely worthless with no design or purpose. Exactly. Now, what is interesting is Jeffrey Dahmer, the notorious serial killer. This is a quote that he said, and he believed in evolution. If a person doesn't think there's a God to be accountable to, then then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution as truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we, when we died, you know, that was it. There is nothing. And it's just an extraordinary quote of someone that, you know what jumps out at me, is it, wasn't, it didn't sound like a madman just ranting. He had a logical sequence to this. He started out with a a, his starting assumption, and he drew a conclusion from it. Absolutely, and, and his, his conclusion is valid. If we're just animals, and really we don't control our actions, we're controlled by our impulses, uh, then uh, w what, why not just do what comes natural, what you feel good doing, even if it kills other people? You know, and what's funny is Richard Dawkins has struggled with this, and he came up with an interesting quote. He said, kind of the, he, Richard Dawkins, I kind of consider him as the high priest of atheism. Sure. He said, I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to science, when it comes to explaining the world, but, but I am a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to morality and politics. Derek, I don't know how you can divide it up like that. Either you, you are a Darwinian or you aren't. Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 the hypocrisy here knows no bounds. And the reason why he wants to believe in Darwinian for science is so he's not accountable to God, but he doesn't want people to live like it because he's afraid of people like Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, he doesn't want to be accountable, but he wants them to be. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, what's fascinating, there was a London ad ran on the side of buses. It says, yeah. there's probably no God. Now, stop worrying and enjoying your life. So the atheists are now proselytizing. They're going forward. They want us not to believe in God. I, I believe this has been one of the new dynamics. I think not too long ago, atheists just wanted left alone. But now they want to control the culture, and they don't want to even hear about God, and they don't want us to be able to speak in the public square. I'm very concerned about that. And, you know, your concerns are, are real because here is another. I pulled this off of a website. It said, our worldview is real reality. And it says, we are realists practicing realism, winning souls for Darwin. Wow. I'm just shocked. Winning souls for Darwin. Atheism. Yeah. Incredible. Now, this is where evolution is going. This is, by, this is a quote from Steven Pinker, and we've already heard about the evils of the foundation of evolution. Let's, did those evils go away? Are they, coming, are they cycling back again? Listen to what Steven Pinker wants us to think of today. He says, do most victims of sexual abuse suffer no lifelong damage? Do men have an innate tendency to rape, 
Did the crime rate go down in the 1990s because two decades earlier, poor women aborted children who, had, who would have been prone to violence? Is morality just a product of the evolution of our brains with no inherent reality? Would it be consistent with our moral principles to give parents the option of euthanizing newborns with birth defects that would consign them to a life of pain and disability? Now, he frames all that as questions, but the implication is he thinks all that's good. That's right. And it's, it's, it's astonishing the danger that this man is willing to take us to. And it takes us all the way back to Margaret Sanger. It takes us all the it way does. back to Ernest Haeckel and to Darwin. They, that's right. They believe those foundations. So nothing's really changed. Now, and here's some sampling of some recent books from the atheists. The God Delusion, which basically says you're a delusion in your mind. You're delusional if you believe in God. God is not great. God, the failed hypothesis, and godlessness in America. And what's fascinating about all of those is that for people who don't believe in God, they spend a lot of time talking about them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and godlessness in America is something I want to point out here because if they don't believe in God, which they say they don't, they should already have a godless America. So they're kind of inconsistent there unless what they really want is they don't want to see God in you or me. Wow. They don't want us in America. You know, there was a, a, a magazine that came out called Focus, and it said Born to Sin was on the cover. And it's a science magazine, and, and, and you have this underneath Born to Sin, it said Why Nature Wants You to Be Bad. And what's fascinating is their conclusions came up very similar to my conclusions in the extinction of evolution. They talk about lust, envy, wrath, and greed, and they actually say that these things are the result of evolution. And they really, what they're saying is we're born to do these things. And so what you see with evolution is it's in the embracing of all sin. It's not the condemning of sin, it's they want to sin, and it's astonishing. And if you look at 2 Thessalonians 1.9, this is what they're afraid of and why they think we're supposed to sin because the reality of the situation is that 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. You know, they're afraid of that reality, and they should be. But that fear should drive them to be humble before an authoritative God. But what they're doing instead is they're running away from God, and it's absolutely tragic. You know, if we go to the Colossians 2.8, and I think, and when I think of what you guys do in the ministry that you have, this passage would mean so much to you. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Aren't we, isn't America in the world falling captive to human tradition right now? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, Early on in, the, uh, in, in this whole debate that's become shaped, Henry Morris wrote a book called The Long War Against God. And really, I think that's part of what all of this is. And, and, and I appreciate that you've written this to, to theistic uh, evolutionists who want to believe in God but believe in evolution. They really need to see evolution for what it is, and it's anti-God. And by being anti-God, it's become anti-human. I mean, they take huge races of people, huge groups of people, and they eliminate them. Margaret Stanger always put her clinics in black neighborhoods to kill babies. She did. She did. And she embraced the eugenics movement of Hitler. They thought killing the Jews was a good thing. Sad enough. In Britain, they were teaching that. And in America, we were sterilizing the poor. And, and yet, we can wipe all of that away, sanitize it and put it into our books, and pass that same philosophy onto our children and think we're going to have different fruit from the same tree. It isn't going to happen. Bad trees make bad fruit. Evolution is a bad tree that makes bad fruit for humanity and takes us away from God. You've done a fascinating job, a great job, of making that clear to our people. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Derek, for sharing with us. You know, my friends, this is a battle for truth, and it's a battle for God's truth. And you don't want to be in the mushy middle trying to see things both ways. You need to commit yourself to understand that God's word is true and that Jesus is the way. And you need to make a commitment to understand the truth through a worldview that makes God's word real and makes God a part of your life. I hope you've heard our show today. I hope you've heard it not just with your ears, but with your heart. And I hope you apply it to your life. And above all, remember this. It's God's view that he created you. That should be your worldview too. Hope to see you again soon here on Origins. And until then, 
God be with you, my friend. God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1407, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.